Okay. Hi, Susie. Hi there. So icons are by no means a rare thing in fashion, but what is incredibly unusual indeed, uh, almost unheard of actually, is a genuine icon in fashion journalism. And Susie Menkes is exactly that, a legend in the field of fashion writing and criticism. Susie is the international editor of Vogue and is the world's leading fashion authority. So much so that her work has seen her awarded an OBE in Britain and the Légion d'honneur in France. A graduate in English language and history from Cambridge, Susie began her career at the Times, then worked at, uh, uh, as a fashion editor at a host of British newspapers, and 25 years at the International Herald Tribune, before joining Vogue, where I work as managing editor for the British edition. Susie is the international editor, so her work appears on 21 Vogue websites across the globe in 15 languages, I think, and reaches an audience of 35 million. Her own Instagram account by itself has over 350,000 followers. That, as they say, is some reach, Susie. So, in an age when it seems that everyone is a critic, does fashion journalism still matter? Now, what do you expect me to say to that? <laughs> of course it matters, it matters a lot. And yet, the best thing I believe that ever happened to our seasoned journalists was the arrival of a whole new breed of people who are engaged by fashion. And what is tremendous, I think, is that anybody now, anybody in the wide world who is interested in fashion can put down on screen their point of view, who can really bring fashion to the world as they see it. But I'd like to add something here, because a lot of people think that there's so many people writing about fashion now, what does it matter who it's from even? Let's look at the pictures, let's not bother with the words. But I must say that I, in my whole career, have been with so many people, so many young journalists coming, and I've always said the same thing about fashion and writing about it or judging it, which is, it's not good because you like it. You like it because it's good. And you know, that really means something that, I don't mean people shouldn't have opinions. It's Im very important for people to have opinions and terrific that opinions are coming now much more from different ages, different countries, from all sorts of places. A lot of innovation comes from people who've never before written or looked really at fashion in a serious way. And yet, at the same time, there is very much a place for people who understand fashion, who've got a back history. I'm talking about me, of course. I started such a long time ago in fashion, and I feel that I'm still learning things all the time. But one of the most important things that I have learned is that you've got to work at it, you've got to look at lots of things, and you've got to treat it as seriously as other things are treated. And one thing that I'd like to say now, before we go into other <laughs> questions, is that everybody can't think about fashion today, or indeed the whole world of people expressing themselves through clothes, without thinking of the recent troubles that we're seeing and that are being revealed. Of course, nobody has been charged yet with anything, and yet the stories we're hearing from models and, of course, from the um, young people working in the film industry it are very frightening and scary. But I'd like to point out something here. Anybody had the opportunity to reveal these, including the people who were so sadly hurt by what happened. But who did reveal it? Journalists from the New York Times, where I used to write, and from the New Yorker. They did it after, in one case, 11 months of research. So I think that even though fashion may have its trivial side and trivial subjects to report, that you can't beat the serious people who really understand journalism. Now, Susie, talking of people who really understand journalism, you're, you're long established in the field of fashion journalism, but yet to a phenomenal degree you've embraced technology, perhaps more than, more than most other journalists. Um, particularly in, in, in fashion. Um, 
If anything, I suspect your profile has grown over the past five years immensely compared to the, the, the previous five or ten. Um, how has, how, for you, how has technology impacted fashion journalism? Well, let's start with me personally. Certainly um, putting myself on Instagram, which I did very early on before absolutely everybody in the fashion world was <laughs> using it, um, certainly was very important to me because I think in, in several ways it enabled me to um, bring together my visual side in which I'm actually very interested in the visuals and my writing side. You will notice that hashtags are not very prevalent on my um, Instagram because I don't want, I want it to be so that I can say something quite concise that people can actually read and something that I hope is useful. In general, of course, the whole business of bringing fashion to the people, that means us, you and me, and absolutely everybody in the world, yeah. has had a tremendous effect. It's had an effect on fashion itself, because people are much more demanding. Fashion is not for the exclusive and for the few. Fashion is for everybody. So that is very important. But as we know, everything's moving so fast in the digital world. I mean, we're talking about uh, different kinds of things that you can do, popping up all the time, so that, you know, one minute is Instagram, the next, it's something else, and it's going to go on like that. If you look at how quickly it's all happening, I think it's very interesting that we are faced with a revolution in a way, and yet that revolution keeps moving. And how about sort of the, the fashion industry itself? Because we talked about how it's changed fashion journalism. Has, has technology uh, impacted fashion in a sort of broader sense in a, in, in a key way to, to you? Of course, nobody who's ever bought anything online, and that's all of us, could possibly think that uh, nothing has changed in the digital world, even though there are still these amazing stores and bricks and mortar offers of clothing. The buying online is, has got to be one of the greatest revolutions. And there again, it's not over yet. We don't really know what's mm. going to happen. So that, I think, is very important. And then there are other issues also, uh, the issues about the speed with which we now see um, fashion. I mean, I'll take you back. I, shall, I hope I'll make you laugh. Uh, <laughs> here is little Susie as a junior reporter going for the first time to the Far Paris collections. And this was at Nina Ricci, a house you've probably not heard too much about. And as I sat there, there was somebody wearing a charming hat. I did a little drawing of a hat. A minute later, I was grabbed by the arms, both of them, by two people, two dragon ladies, who led me out and dumped me outside. Because at that time, you were not allowed to show fashion except three months ahead when it went on sale. This was haute couture. Can you imagine this? You couldn't see what the fashion was shown was like for three months. I mean, now if you didn't see it for three days, you'd wonder what had gone mm. wrong. That has been a tremendous change. Well, the, in fact, one of, the, one of the more obvious changes in the fashion media uh, over the past decade um, has been the rise of the blogger or, uh, or more broadly the influencer. Um, whether that's a, a critic, a journalist, or, or a celebrity. What do we mean by influencer, and, and, and how has that impacted the business and fashion journalism itself? Well, one of my main reasons coming to this summit was to find out what influencers are, because I don't really know. Maybe all of you do. It seems to be people who get the most number of viewers or people who click for them. I don't really understand why this makes people influencers. I'm, I am faintly suspicious about the idea because after all, not very difficult just to get all your friends to um, go and try and push your numbers along. But of course, I know what it means in its general term. Influencers are people, or this is the, this I hope is the best idea, that they are people who are immensely stylish, who perhaps are connected to the fringes of the fashion industry and who use um, all the high-tech places to place themselves and often to make comments that can be very interesting. That's the best of it. The other side, we don't want to mention too much, people who are just paid to put up something and say, darling, you were wonderful. Um, 
you know, that's the other side of it. Yeah. But I, I certainly don't feel, I am absolutely not anti the idea that fashion should go across the world and across people, across countries. I think it's one of the best things and I think it's very good for education. You know, it's a really wonderful thing that if you live in a small country or maybe a little town in the, in the depths of America, that you now, if you want to, you can do a um, university course online. And things like that have given us so many more opportunities, which is why I would never say that things were better before. <laughs> and how about how influencers have, have changed the industry? And, and I'm thinking of perhaps the beauty industry in particular, or the, the, the beauty sphere of, of, of the wider fashion industry. Uh, uh, have influences impacted the industry itself and not just coverage of the industry? Well, I mean, I think that this is such a smart question. Uh, you must work for Vogue or somewhere like that. <laughs> because, of course, you're right. I mean, I think the great example for all this is Huda Beauty. She is a phenomenon. She's an extraordinary woman working from the Middle East. She built entirely on Instagram a way of making yourself more beautiful. Um, when I had her speak in a conference about this time last year, one of the international, uh, one of the um, conferences that we um, do for Vogue, uh, I think she then had 12 million followers. I believe now she has 22 million. Did you check it out this morning? Wow. And the reason why she's so successful is because she has changed, almost single-handedly, the attitude to beauty. And what I think is so impressive is that she's done it by absolutely embracing everybody and their needs and desires and their nerves about themselves. Nobody is too small or too tall or too plain or too anything not to be considered by her. She makes the products to make you feel better and shows all the time, there's so many posts, how to look. But I think there are many other people because beauty has been one of the big areas yeah. where there have been, a, you know, there are masses of different um, people doing things online on all offering a lot of information and a lot of intelligence. And I think that, that I would say that Huda Beauty has done something to the entire industry without meaning to. She's changed the attitude of these often slightly snotty people who serve in the grand stores across the world. The people who make you feel that you look so hopeless and your skin is so terrible that your eyes are so crooked that without buying their truly wonderful products, you really hardly have a hope left in this world. <laughs> it's, not, it's not how people want to be treated in the 21st century. They want somebody to say, how nice to see you. Yes, you're interested in eye makeup. Well, you've got eyes that are quite close together, so let's do this and show you how to make them apart. That's the new way. And it's come now to our shop floors as well and to our beauty parlors. There's no longer that attitude that they are too grand to speak to anyone who isn't already a beauty. And I think that really the beauty industry has been changed by the digital world. It, it sounds in that sense like um, uh, digital uh, and, and tech has been a great liberator in, in, or a great democratizer for fashion uh, in, in, in some respects. I think that tech has been a democratizer but I also think there's, you know, we mustn't exaggerate here, technology has always been part of the world of fashion and indeed beauty. I mean, there were days when people put things on their faces that were not good for them at all, but there were still inventive things. Yeah. And right from the beginning, technology was used. After all, I don't know, I can't do, my, do the dates, but maybe 150 years ago when people started first doing things by factory, it was considered to be an absolutely amazing change and a wondrous thing. Yeah. And making things by hand was a poor substitute. That, of course, has now gone full circle. But, you know, these things are in the part of the history of fashion, these kinds of changes. Yeah. And before I sort of we move on to the, the, the future of, of, of fashion and how it intersects with tech, do you think there's any danger at all, going back to influencers, where, where it's unclear for the consumer or the reader or the audience what, what 
a, a big brand is perhaps behind and back in what's advertised, in what's editorial, what's commercial? Or does the consumer not really care anymore? I think the c consumers are smarter than you think. That, you know, we do see how many different, you get Snapchat, which is obviously more, it comes and it goes, it's different, it's a, almost like a personal discussion, um, that it's harder for other people to get inside you, inside what you do and inside your yeah. phone or your um, laptop. So I think that people are very aware of these things. You know, in some cases, maybe they're only pleased about this that they want to be helped, they want to be told about products that they don't know about. So I, I don't think we should see baddies and goodies. Goodies the ones that yeah. are totally low level but build themselves up and tell people how to do things and baddies are the ones who have been making beauty products for maybe 50 years. Yeah. Um, they can still be very good. The much wider subject, which is, you know, I'm sure it's been spoken about many times in the last few days by people much smarter than me, is you know how much we are in control of what we're seeing, how much we really understand right. um, whether people are trying to in influence indeed, not as influencers, but really change our lives, whether, you know, after all, when you get questions about whether the um, uh, United States president was, whether there was an influence on that from Russia, I mean, these are such huge issues that it's hardly surprising that they are touching on fashion. So how does fashion fit into an era of fake news? Who knows? Um, OK, so I guess what comes next for, for fashion journalism, but in particular, how it uses and is used by technology? Well, I start from the uh, idea that technology is good and that a lot of good is coming out of it. And when I was saying just now about how technology, and, or not technology, but um, uh, there were everything has changed in the fashion world over the years and become not digitalized but made by machines etc I think you get another um, situation where there are so many fascinating and interesting and wonderful things being done now uh, the main area that interests me is um, it's not fake fashion it's not fake fabrics it's not fake anything but it's how to produce a look or a project that a, a, an object that people want, but to do it in a way that is not, for example, harmful to animals. You know, th th somebody who feels really strongly about this should be rejoicing in the fact that the work now to produce to grow leather, but to grow it not from a dead animal, but to grow it from um, uh, however you grow these things, I'm not so wonderful on this subject, but I know it's being done, and I think probably within five, seven years, alongside the um, cars that drive themselves, you will get fabrics that are made, more fabrics that are made in a lab than are necessarily made in Mother Earth. Yeah. And you know, that's going to be very, not just exciting, but very important and very poignant because from the beginning of time, from the beginning of Adam and Eve pulling the, uh, the um, tree leaves off in order to cover their nakedness, Somehow fashion has almost always used nature in order to make the coverings of our bodies. If we can now really start doing this, of course there have been previous attempts, and most of them slightly hideous, right through the 1930s. We had all these inventions of um, fabrics like nylon that were not um, uh, linked to animals and their, what happens to them. But we're now talking about a different thing. We're talking about a growth of something that is made in the lab and done that way. And this really is something new and something exciting for fashion, I think. So in that sense, it's sort of fashion reflecting the times again, isn't it, really? And it just it happens to be the technology of the time that it's reflecting. Um, and how about, I, I suppose, finally, the, the, the platforms w with which we consume fashion? Um, or, or indeed, I suppose, the fashion calendar as well um, links into that. You talked earlier about imme the immediacy of fashion now or the desire for immediate fashion fix. Do, can you see that changing in any significant way um, in the near future? I think everything needs to be modernised, particularly the shows themselves. 
you know, the, just this idea of seeing pictures of the models walking up and down the runway, you don't even see their backs, for heaven's sake, even though that might be very important to the designer. I think there's going to be a lot of change in that way. There have been lots of questions asked about when things should be shown, all these things. But definitely, this is the digital world is going to not just embrace, but it's going to eat up all these fading and ancient ideas. And that's very good. I'd like to say at this point that if anybody wants very up-to-date and very strong ideas, I'll be back in Lisbon in mid-April for the next of the uh, fashion conferences that they're actually luxury conferences that we um, hold for uh, CNI, that's Condé Nast International. And there'll be many speakers who are looking at these kind of subjects. It's called the language of fashion. And if we had longer, I would try to explain to you what that means. <laughs> and, um, and, and finally then, I guess, um, we started with the, the fate of the fashion journalist. Um, I, I think we're all agreed that the, the fate is pretty, it's, we're in pretty rude health, aren't we? Well, I feel in rude health about it, and I feel very enthusiastic, but the more so because there's so many new people coming into the arena. And I would say, not that he's new to me, but uh, having Edward Enninful on um, British Vogue, putting a mixed race model on the cover, thinking about what is his own background, the mixed races and different people, it's a whole new era, and it's time for this. It's really strong, really powerful, and really important that fashion and fashion writing and fashion journalism should reflect the reality of the world today. It isn't enough to look back. It isn't enough to say that there are great young designers starting. Everything has got to be tuned and fine-tuned to what the world today is like. I feel terrific about seeing Edward doing this as a man Absolutely. himself of colour. It makes, it, it must inspire so many young people who think how could they ever make it to Vogue and he has done so. And I think that the future for me is very exciting and technology has made it the more so. And finally, okay, one last. How, how soon will you upload your next story onto Instagram just to show technology in action in fashion? How, how soon between now and your next update, um, would you well, say? Well, I, I hope that my story on, story on called Karl Lagerfeld and his photography, um, which I saw yesterday in Paris at the Grand Palais, um, I hope that's uploading as we speak. You can check it, um, and you'll certainly see it all on Instagram already. When will my next story be? Well, what you mean is, what will my next story be? <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you. You wouldn't tell me. Susie Menkes, thank you very much.